when people start our program, they start with a mix of those buckwheat, quinoa, and uh, and amaranth, and we just see you know a really rapid reduction in symptoms. Those grains are incredibly nutrient rich, complete proteins, and the whole works. And so we eat that lots of lots of leafy greens and some sweet potatoes, and that rapidly reduces inflammation. And then we test foods back into the diet one at a time. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsy and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. So last week, Dotsie, uh, she teased us, saying that she might share with us a little bit of her book. So Dotsie, hi. So good to see you. And, <laughs> it's um, good to see you. I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to read a little bit of this book that you've been working on um, to, uh, you know, to share a little bit about what you've been up to. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I'm going to read an excerpt. So get cozy, peeps, like uh, snuggle up. It's only a couple pages, so you don't have to, to uh, take a break for too long. Uh, but a, as I think I mentioned last week, the the, the working title, which will change probably 10 more times, is The Gangland War of Being Female from War to Peace in the Female Body. And it's, it's, it's basically a story of deconstruction to construction. Um, and so in the beginning, of course, I go into kind of the roots of the deconstruction, right? When I, when I feel like I really started to separate from myself and my mind, my heart, my gut started to uh, like, let's live separately. So I am going to read this uh, short section, which will probably certainly get added to and 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 change some. But uh, but here we go, and and maybe our listeners. We heard can... it first. Yeah, let me know if you like it, or what you don't like, or if it if it uh, connects with you in any way. All right. So, how did this volatile and soul crushing disconnection happen to me? How did I go from a seemingly connected eight-year-old winning championship horseback riding competition aboard my horse dreamer? How did I hate myself so much I wanted to disappear? How did I stand on stage topless dancing in complete control and in charge all bet with sniveling broken men drooling at my feet? How did I break the frozen experience of being high and starving myself? Truth, I don't entirely know where all the pain came from. Was it pain or was it just a siphoning off of my feelings and sensibilities? Was it repression? Goodness, I just can't pick one thing or even a series of many things, but what I do know is I was lost, sad, desperate, and focused, focused on figuring out a way to end it all that would not hurt the people who loved me. I was not raped as a child. I had good, solid, deeply loving parents. No one hurt me physically or spiritually, spiritually. No one ripped my heart out. I did have three abortions. I did get molested as an adult. I did have many people tell me I wasn't good enough, but I had equal parts. People told me I was worth it. I did have my first show horse dreamer, my best friend, ripped away from me when my parents sold her. It was time for an upgrade so that I could continue progressing as a young rider. At least that's what my trainers told us. The pain that remains to this day is that there was no such thing as an upgrade from Dreamer. Her official name the breeders had given her was Follow a Dream, and I aptly titled her Dreamer. And dreaming is what we did most days together. I would hang out with her in 
her stall, even on the most blistering summer of days, the heat and humidity that Kentucky has to offer. We would lay still on a mound of hay pointing our faces toward this gigantic fan that was the top right-hand corner of her stall. I would rub my tiny hands over her eyelids. She would open and close them with each caress. Her eyes were giant to me and I knew she could see through to my soul. She knew my dreams and she knew she would stand beside me as we chased them together. In winter, the blacksmith would take her heavy show, show horse shoes off and we would do pleasure riding through the hills and cross creeks and run in the pastures that connected them. I would ride bareback and she would protect me as we flew through the wind, running just fast enough to hear me giggle with thrill, but not so fast that it would be dangerous for me. When we got back to the barn one day after a pleasure ride, we turned into the, one of the barn aisles and at the exact same time, a sawdust truck was dumping a giant load right in front of us. Dreamer panicked and reared up straight in the air like you see in an Arabian horse painting. And I fell off and she fell all the way backwards on top of me, breaking all of my ribs on my right side. When she landed on me, she immediately rolled over, jumped to her feet. She was not concerned with her own fear, only with my injured body. She put her face down to mine and left it there until I had the strength to reach up, grab her bridle and get up to my feet. Her love was vast and gentle, enduring and steadfast. And so I will never forget that feeling when she was driven down the driveway of Rock Creek Farm away from me. I had just spent the last hours struggling with her in her stall. All 1200 pounds of her wrapped around my body and we laid there motionless. I felt guilty and shameful and she knew it. I told myself this is what had to happen for me to grow as a show horse rider. It was time for the next shiny new horse to show up and ride or take me to the next level. But Dreamer was all I wanted. She was all I ever wanted. She should have been my forever girl. I loved her so, so much. She was patient and gentle yet fiercely beautiful and animated in the show ring. She had been trained with crack whips and stretchies and ankle chains and spurs to perform her magical trot with her knees reaching so high to the sky with every step. I look back and it baffles me that I could not connect to the level of cruelty that she was enduring, all to take her little girl Dotsie into the ring to come out with a blue ribbon. As I look back on that day when they took her away, it was my very first lesson in disconnecting. I wasn't aware of it as I was only nine, but that day I set up det a detachment shop inside my being. If I separated the pain I was feeling in my heart by controlling it with my mind, I could con continue to do what I was doing. If I had stopped and honored the reality of what just took place, which was I sold my best friend for personal gain and more blue ribbons, well, maybe my life would have taken another route. But on that day on Rock Creek Road, as the love of my life was driven away from my reach, I raged a war with myself and divided myself into parts, no longer in alignment with the whole so that I could not feel any more pain. I told myself that love wasn't real and my feelings didn't matter. This is what society likes to call survival technique, but it is really that. Would I have died otherwise? Of course not. I would have lived and I would have woken up to the cruelty and the suffering and the meaning of it all so much sooner than I actually did because it took 25 more years for me to stitch myself back together. I don't know if I'm going to read anymore because I'm just... Uh, oh, wow, that's so powerful. Thanks for listening. And for anybody else that's still listening, thank you. Thank you so much, Dotsie. Um, mm. I, uh, I just, I, um, I can't wait to read more of your book and thank you for opening yourself up and sharing that. I, I think a lot of us can probably delve up, um, stories from our own childhoods where yeah. we did things like that. Yeah. And I, I encourage people to, to write because, um, I didn't continue on, but I, I go on to say that I didn't. The, the, the real visceral experience of that did not come to me. I, like I had, I had packed it away until I started writing about Dreamer. Mm. I, I hadn't connected that that was my very first, that was my very first real detachment um, until I started writing. So it can be very healing, whether you do anything with it or not. Um, but it was, it was, it was powerful to write that. And um, it, it took 
it took a while because I, I couldn't stop sobbing th- throughout remembering, remembering that. So just encouraging people to, to um, writing is a wonderful um, and healing tool to, to, to let things out. Yeah. That you've maybe kept in and then you can, you don't have to share it with anyone if you, if you don't want to, or you can share it with an entire audience. <laughs> And then cry as you look. Well, that's great. I think that these these it's so honest. So thank you for sharing that. You're you're beautiful, and uh, it was really touching for me to hear you say that you were this uh, detachment was because you were um, honoring this desire, your dream to become a blue ribbon rider, um, you had to give up dreamer. That's really powerful. And, and, and that happens with all of us that we've done things that we think we're following ourselves, but we're actually yeah. not. So. I gotta say, I'm glad I, I'm glad I stopped and I started riding a bicycle because I, to, to my knowledge, they can't feel. So that was a better choice, I think for the long term. So Thanks. Thanks for being a safe space. Thank you. Thank you all. Let's, oh my gosh, we have such a crazy, awesome guest today. So let's dry the tears and turn our <laughs> frowns upside down and, okay. and uh, get ready to learn and be empowered. Well, I'm very excited about this guest because actually my mother-in-law sent me an email because she's been dealing with an autoimmune disease for the last couple of years. And she is a big fan of our guest. And she sent me one of his newsletters and I was immediately intrigued. I went to watch his wonderful TEDx talk and got very excited about inviting him on the show. And here he is all the way from Australia. We have Clint Pattison. He was a top student in laser physics at his university in Australia, but he instead went on to a career as a very funny comedian on his way to the top. One day when he was 31, he woke up with sore feet. Clint was then diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and over the next few years, he became incapacitated by the disease. His wrist, ankles, feet, elbows, chest, and jaw were all swollen, immobile, and racked with pain. And it was actually food poisoning that set him on a true healing journey. And his science background guided him to a health plan that gave him his life back. Now Clint helps others overcome autoimmune disorders, especially rheumatoid arthritis. And Dotsie and I are really, really happy to have you on the show today, Clint. Thank you. Oh, what a lovely introduction. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be part of this. <laughs> well, truly, um, my mother-in-law feels like you've helped her so much. And um, she actually is off prednisone completely. I'm very proud of her. Um, we also had another autoimmune expert on the show, Dr. Brooke Goldner. And um, I'm sure you're, you know, and you share a lot of the same philosophies. So let's dive in to your journey with rheumatoid arthritis. You talk a lot about it in your TED talk. Can you give us um, an abbreviated view so that people will be excited to go actually listen to your TED talk too? Yes, well, uh, you did a really good job of, of uh, getting the, the main points there, which was uh, 31 years old, thought I was going to do comedy as a career uh, long term, uh, was doing well with stand up comedy, had been on TV a few times, you know, thought, hey, my career's going really well. And I was traveling around. In fact, I was interstate doing stand up when I first developed my feet pain. And, um, and, and then that changed everything. Instead of it becoming about, you know, where can I travel to next and how can I, you know, try and progress my career, it was what, how, and how am I going to fix this joint pain? Because I'd sit down to write jokes and my, my hand would hurt or my elbow was bothering me. And so you just couldn't get into a creative state because you're constantly concerned with that. It's a bigger sort of occupying spot in your brain than trying to come up with some trivial, you know, laugh material. And so, mm-hmm. yes, that progressed from feet pain to finger pain and all of the areas that you mentioned in the introduction. Saw the rheumatologist eventually, he said, very aggressive, seropositive rheumatoid arthritis to those folks who, who understand that jargon, uh, basically meaning that, you know, very serious case and very progressive 
because I'd already presented with so many joints after just two months mm. of, uh, in the time I waited to see the specialist. And so it was a discussion around uh, methotrexate, which is sort of an um, early intervention drug, even though it is mild chemotherapy. And, uh, and started that, uh, you know, sometime down the future. And, and uh, yeah, but, but, but symptoms just progressed until, as you said, it was about a food poisoning. I ate some cherries that had been unwashed and they'd obviously been touched or handled a lot and, and maybe were covered in pesticides and they'd been imported actually from the state. So they'd travel a long way, certainly not locally grown organic <laughs> cherries. Um, and uh, about a food poisoning revealed that after I was purging from both ends, that all my symptoms went away. And this was such an epiphany for me. Uh, and I thought all I need to do for the rest of my life is just do vomiting and diarrhea each day. Um, but <laughs> obviously there has to be a better way than that. And that's that we began my journey and it, and it went initially, um, initially I was reluctant to give up meat and dairy for a lot of the reasons that maybe your audience also are afraid of things like weight loss, because I've always been a slim frame. I didn't, I, I associated the meats, especially with, uh, with masculinity and, and mm. protein and strength. And, um, and also just the unfamiliarity of it, because I'd grow up on a farm where meat was on the table three times a day, uh, often from uh, a source that had a name that we knew. But this yeah. is just how we, we, we grew up and, uh, or I grew up with my family. And so the whole thing was, was very, very, um, a, a state of immense change, worry, concern, and so forth. So um, yeah, the switch to plant-based was slow. And when it happened, it didn't suddenly eliminate all my symptoms. There was, as I was to find out, and I'm still learning, uh, there's so much to know about this disease um, that it's not just what we eat, but there are other influencing factors. Um, but the diet is, uh, is like the concrete slab of the house. And we get our diet right and we do all the things that we know scientifically, which I can talk a lot about the science behind this, not just my experience and anecdotal mm -hmm. stories, but the evidence. And uh, scientifically, we know now how to eat with this disease. Um, and and that's, just, that, that's just the commonsensical following the science kind of approach. And then we have to do all these other things on top to reverse certain uh, inflammatory areas in our body, get our mindset right, begin to exercise when we're reluctant to because we hurt and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I mean, that gives you a, just a flavor of the point to which I began going plant-based. I was excited when we just were chatting for a few moments before we started recording because you said my, uh, your wife was taking care of the three children, getting them off to school because it's 7.45 in the morning there. Because at the end of the TED talk, you know, you reveal that um, I think your daughter was only six weeks old at the time, but but you talk about this almost what felt like almost like a death sentence when you got rheumatoid arthritis flared up. I wouldn't say you got it right. I mean, it, it was it was it was it was possibly always swimming around in it, and the, and and what you were eating exacerbated. It came out and. They said you had, here's the methotrexate, which you definitely took many journeys down before you took the methotrexate, right? Because it can make you sterile or it would definitely make you sterile, I believe. And so these are the options people are given for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm, I'm assuming some other autoimmune it's live in pain or live in emotional pain because you're not going to be able to have children. Wait, 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 wait. I want to walk through a little bit for those that are listening that maybe are going to find hope for sure in this episode, uh, where you were when you had to lean in or you felt like you had to lean in and say, okay, do you still have that methotrexate? I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've written down three little points there to cover off and I'll do all three in okay, this answer. Okay, so okay. first of all, you mentioned that the, the swimming around and maybe that the, inf that the inflammatory arthritis was uh, underlying or, or ready to present itself depending on the way I, I approach my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, there's been tremendous evidence coming out in the last few years about the relationship between antibiotic use and the later development of rheumatoid arthritis and it's a dose dependent relationship and a recency relationship, um, meaning that the more 
doses of antibiotics that a human being takes, the increased risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Gosh. Now, furthermore, your risk, if that antibiotic was recent, say within the last 12 months, is at its greatest. So you take an antibiotic, you've just bumped up your risk of developing a, a rheumatoid arthritis, and then slowly your risk diminishes with time, unless you continue to add more doses. Now, now does I it need went... to be, sorry to interrupt, it needs, does it need to be, as Dati mentioned, swimming around? Like, do you need to have a propensity for it? Or is there something that anyone can get? It's funny you should say that because I recently endeavored to write a blog post called Is Rheumatoid Arthritis Hereditary? And it was so complicated that I outsourced it to a medical writer who then came back with the blog post ready for me. And then I struggled to read it as well because it's very complicated. But there are the, the simplest way of saying it is just like I think every, every chronic disease, as Dean Ornish uh, uses the phrase, that our genes load the gun, but our lifestyle pulls the trigger. And I think it's exactly uh, the same with rheumatoid arthritis. My rheumatologist told me, don't worry, your kids aren't going to develop rheumatoid arthritis. It's not hereditary. He told me that 15 years ago um, uh, when I said I wanted to eventually have kids. But the studies now seem to indicate a hereditary component. But when we get into talking about the microbiome, it's your gut bacteria which is where 60% of your immune system lies in the lining between what goes through and digested to what enters your bloodstream, your bacteria and everything lining along that uh, mucosal wall is that's where it's at. And so this will, in, will dictate the, uh, the, the rollout or not of the autoimmune disease. And so okay. uh, to close this section off, I took antibiotics as a teenager for five consecutive years because I had acne. And my dad said, oh, when I was a teenager and I couldn't get rid of my acne, I took antibiotics and it worked a treat. And before Did you, you take know, Accutane by chance? I didn't, but I've got okay. clients who took Accutane who have rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm not I took two, do two courses of it. So I was, that's really scared me in your TED talk when you talked about that. Right. Well, you know, uh, just mm. disclaimer, you know, I'm not making this specific uh, accusation or saying mm. anything around that. I'm just saying that the studies indicate yeah. antibiotics equals yeah. higher risk of rheumatoid. Now, so, so, I, so I, as you put it, uh, was kind of running a dysbiosis or an imbalanced uh, gut bacteria portfolio. For years into my 20s, I had digestive issues. I was burping, gassing problems. You know, I, if I tried to eat ice cream, which of course now I know we shouldn't anyway, but as I tried to eat ice cream, my nose would immediately block up. I couldn't breathe. So it just, it was like, I was very reactionary. And then I went over in, uh, just before I turned 31 and, uh, and I entertained the troops in Iraq and did, and did three weeks mm. of stand-up comedy to the Australian, the Italian, mostly the US, uh, some English forces over in the Middle East. And for that, we needed three months of the exact same antibiotic that I took as a teen uh, for malaria prevention. And after coming mm. back to Australia, within two months, I had developed symptoms. So for me, knowing the science of how much antibiotics I'd taken and the strong correlation with dose dependency with developing RA and the recency of having just done it for three months and then developing symptoms for me as someone who has no family history of this disease, I'm pretty sure that antibiotics had something to do with it. So yeah. that, that was what was going on. But Dotsie, you asked like, what, what was the emotional state when I thought, mm. oh, this is futile. And, uh, and as I said on more than one occasion to my now wife, Melissa, you'd be better off, you know, getting hit by a bus, really, I think, because of my, my situation. And, and I meant that because whilst I was on eventually maximum dose of methotrexate, which is the, the, the drug that you can't take when you're having planning for, 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 for a family, uh, my symptoms were uncontrolled. And we were looking at then, of course, or starting a biologic drug. And what this is, an immunomodulating, very, very, um, you know, expensively created in labs kind of immunomodulator. And uh, on the table are ones like Humira and Enbrel, which, you know, you might see right. as Americans, 
on the TV while you're having dinner. Hey, you should get some Humira if you can't hit a ball for 200 yards. Yep. Right? All the time. Which is insane to the rest of the world that in the United States, companies can advertise directly to the public so that you actually mm -hmm. have desire for these drugs. Mm -hmm. But um, look, that's a, that's a little just aside because we've mm. spent some time living in Florida and we've seen the ads. <laughs> Thank you, Ronald Reagan. Yep, yep. Was it from him, was it? Okay. Well, so we were talking about these additional drugs and, and there is some evidence to suggest that even when on a biologic drug, the, the family planning preventing methotrexate it, it still offers additional value. And so we were just looking at adding to it rather than trying to change things up so that I could start a family. Yeah. So it just okay. looked like it wasn't going to happen. It looked like I'm going to be stuck in this regime mm -hmm. forever. And, uh, and then Melissa, um, Melissa basically uh, just kept saying, God, you know, I've been, she was, she's been vegetarian since she was born. She's never tasted meat. Mm -hmm. She's eaten dairy on and off throughout the, uh, the years, cheese and so forth. But um, at this point, you know, she's just like, you gotta, please, please, please try this for me. And, and so, yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was through her encouragement that I went, uh, you know, down that path and her ability to prepare delicious plant-based meals that enabled me to, 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 to do this because I sympathize for people who, who are in the position I was in, but who don't have any Melissa's, you know, they don't have a Melissa or someone <laughs> who can, who, can, who have some skill. You know, I was a completely pathetic, like, bachelor who who ate 95 percent of his meals outside i was not developed in the skill of of making nice food at home can we go back just a bit and can you explain what rheumatoid arthritis is how it differs from osteoarthritis and how it fits into the autoimmune family yeah so osteoarthritis is more common, but it's the one that's called degenerative arthritis and is generally considered to be old age arthritis or something that happens through wear or tear. Now, if you pay attention to the likes of Dr. McDougall, who's researched into this uh, uh, quite a lot and put mm -hmm. forward the evidence on this, it seems that there is an inflammatory component in osteoarthritis just like there is in rheumatoid arthritis. However, it's kind of like David and Goliath in terms of the inflammatory component. With rheumatoid arthritis, it is the, it's the Goliath of inflammatory uh, arthritic conditions. There is an autoimmune component. There are food sensitivities. There's oxidative stress and other complicated mechanisms going on. But the main difference is that rheumatoid arthritis is really, really aggressive and can affect all joints, even if you've used them a lot or not, it's got really nothing to do with any wear or tear history that you've had, um, with the exception that it will attack joints that have been damaged more than those who have had no past injury, sporting injury or so on. By way of example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I tore my ACL uh, playing touch rugby over here the same week that I actually was diagnosed with rheumatoid. So that was a pretty rough week, but I was never able to have my ACL repaired surgically because the inflammation went straight to that knee and stayed there because there was a damage point in the knee. And that's where the, the, uh, the, the uh, inflammation tends to get stuck, as I like to say. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so rheumatoid arthritis, it'll, it, it's very, very painful. It feels when you have it in your joints, like there's glass in the joints, broken little bits of glass. And if you bump an inflamed knuckle or an inflamed elbow against a wall by mistake, or even a family member or the chair, as you're pulling a chair out, it, this, it's the most disgustingly awful pain because it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like, a normal kind of pain. It feels like this, uh, this additional layer of something's wrong with that. It's not normal. That joint's not normal. So you get this double feeling of pain, but also weird distress at the same time. Yeah. I remember you talking about that in your Ted talk, first of all, that it started in your feet, but the shards of glass as you would bend your knee or bend your elbow. Mm. Is that how fast did it come on and, and how might someone have an indicator that they are 
they possibly have RA? Um, well, it typically shows up in opposite same joints, like in the left and right thumb in the oh. same knuckle. And it typically oh. also affects, you know, um, well, yeah, the sym symmetry or the uh, symmetric nature of it is one of the telltale signs. Um, and also tending to feel worse in the morning. And when you're getting out of bed, noticing that, yes, those areas are sore. And also they seem to be worse, as I said, uh, when you get up in the morning. A sense of um, persistence that nothing seems to clear it, whether or not yeah. you keep trying different things, it seems stuck. These are signs to go see the rheumatologist. No, well, you would start with your primary care. And the tests to run are rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibodies. These are, well, they're, they're indicators of autoimmunity and the anti-CCP antibody is a complicated one, mm -hmm. but it shows that you have some, um, uh, some antibodies to, 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 well, these peptides, which are related and could be, you know, initiated by this bacteria in your mouth called P. gingivalis. So it, not everyone has either of those two and they can still have symptoms as well. You can be what's called seronegative. But generally, if we're talking umbrella term, uh, see a doctor, run some blood tests, they'll know the ones to run and they'll give you the diagnosis there and then you would see a specialist. Okay. Mm. Does, in terms of autoimmune diseases, those are diseases where the body attacks itself. Is that, is that sort of the reason? And, and is there, if someone has one autoimmune disease like you uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, are you more vulnerable to other autoimmune diseases or does this tend to stay in its lane? No, it's a wonderful question. And yes, so rheumatoid arthritis falls very much bullseye into the you know, autoimmune category. In fact, um, you know, it would be alongside multiple sclerosis right up there as like, you know, the main um, target for pharmaceutical, you know, companies to, to try and provide assistance to. In fact, Humira, as I mentioned before, um, certainly last time I looked at the stats, which was two to three years ago, it was the highest grossing drug in the world, like the most highest revenue medication in the world and its mm. main uh, you know, its main um, customer or application is for autoimmune disease and in particular rheumatoid arthritis. So, uh, yeah, so very much. So it's common. So rheumatoid arthritis is a very common autoimmune disease. Can you give us any idea of, does it, I, I know that um, because I get your newsletter now, um, I know that you have an 11 year old who's gone through your program and but also people in, in their um, 70s. So when does it, does there a specific time it strikes? To, is it more common in men? And the developed world, does it tend to be more common? What are some stats about where it shows up? Western world, it's one to 2%. So that's Australia, Canada, United States, United mm -hmm. Kingdom. And as you mentioned in the developing world, it's far less prevalent because people are eating rice and beans and potatoes and they don't uh, indulge in things like particularly uh, processed foods and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, have free radically loaded um, uh, heated seed oils and things like this. And so, and, and, I, and I don't know about the antibiotic connection in that case, but um, you know, I'm sure they have, Plenty of other problems that the Western world has eliminated, but in terms of the uh, autoimmunity, they run at a, at a lower rate, a much lower rate. And interestingly, again, just to cite Mac Dr. McDougall's work, because I found these studies via him, um, people who then move from those developing nations into a Western style diet, then tend to have the same sort of uh, development rate as you know, the, the folks that they eat at the same restaurants as. So it's definitely lifestyle influenced. Um, and in terms of, uh, well, I've forgotten your other question, but it was a great question. Age and gender. Uh, uh, yeah, was age that... and gender. Yeah. So the youngest person that we've helped her was diagnosed at 11 months old. So, mm -hmm. and she had and not to harp on this, harp on this too much, but she'd also undergone 
four or five consecutive courses of antibiotics and hers were for ear infections as we know that mm. young children are susceptible to and so she's gone ear infection after ear infection after ear infection and it's just it you know she's had five courses of antibiotics over you know five consecutive months or, or thereabouts and uh and then yes began her treatment on methotrexate at a very young age very 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 young age and then later moved on to one of the biologic drugs that, that i mentioned however statistically most uh people who develop the disease are you know 40 to 50 year old and female and mm -hmm. there are a lot of theories as to why is it two to one females to males and there's a lot of different theories around them and they're only theories. So I won't list like five different theories because people are only still guessing as to why that might be. Okay. Mm. Well, it does sound that the evidence hundred uh, percent shows that inflammation is a part of it. It is a trigger of it and inflammation weaves through so many of our modern diseases and you have some recommendations to us um, on how to lower inflammation. I would love to hear those. They, I, I don't remember them in the TED Talk. So I think this is post, maybe this is post TED Talk. Yeah, yeah I think TED Talk was 2013. And so mm -hmm. since then, you know, so much has transpired. And what has transpired the most is just the number of people who've now gone down this path. And, you know, it feels really, really mm -hmm. nice to say that over 15,000 people have actively become plant-based by following our program over the years. Um, yeah. And a great portion of those have remained compliant and have remained continuing to do this because mm -hmm. quite frankly, it works. You know, it, it's a process that works. And it is, as you say, that's about reducing inflammation. And inflammation... Um, uh, it arises because inside someone, and now we're going to hit some heavy science here. So Good. <laughs> right, let me put my teacher hat on for a moment. And <laughs> what we've got here, if you have inflammatory arthritis and you have uh, an awareness of the medical literature, you can go and check this for yourself, or you can go to pattersonprogram.com forward slash guide, G U I D E. Okay. And there we Can I ask a, you a question? Cause I just, yeah. that just hit me inflammatory yes. arthritis mm -hmm. so not isn't all it is all arthritis inflammatory it it it, it is but okay. the the osteoarthritis level of inflammation is only maybe a, a few percent compared to what's possible with rheumatoid okay thank you so yeah so with inflammatory arthritis, it, it what it's refer what I'm referring to is autoimmune arthritis, rheumatoid, sciatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, lupus, mm. and these these sort yeah. of conditions. Yeah, mm. and so with those, well, we know with rheumatoid that's there's vast amounts of research has been done now on the microbiome or the bacteria relationship with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is extremely well studied. And so, um, you know, if you hear doctors say there's not much study on, you know, diet and rheumatoid arthritis, that's, they just haven't seen the literature. It's there, it's there and it's yeah. been well reviewed and, and I'll be referring to it here and there. So uh, we know that rheumatoid arthritis patients have an increased amount of pathogenic bacteria. So bacteria that's just not supportive to health. They also have lower levels of uh, certain bacteria that are helpful for our gut. Um, and they also um, have, uh, in, in a significant number of cases, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So not just in the bowel where 80, 90% of the bacteria in our body lie, which is in the large intestine, but also in the small intestine. And so we shouldn't necessarily have too much bacteria there. There's not much mucus and the bacteria live in the mucus. And so the mucus increases in density and thickness as it moves down, getting closer and closer towards the end, having the most mucus in your bowel and occupying therefore a home for most of our bacteria. But we can develop small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in the intestine, small intestine. And the uh, relationship between that is also um, not dose, but uh, the, basically the more bacteria in the small intestine that's overgrown, the more symptoms in rheumatoid arthritis. So there's a connection there. 
what's going on is that in a normal healthy intestine, it is the incredible beyond human comprehension wisdom of tiny microbes that dictate what goes into your bloodstream and what should stay in your colon. Mm. They decide for us, and this is beyond belief that these tiny single you know, microbes, which are in the trillions, are then influencing us to the point of life and death. And so we got to make sure that team, that tiny, massive team is getting the right food and that you haven't got some crazy guys and misbehaviors, but we're all, you know, they're all working together to do the right thing for us. So um, th there's this concept of sort of um, intestinal permeability, or we call it leaky gut. And we have a, a migration of some food particles from what, what we want to draw energy from that move into our into our bloodstream via this wall that, that protects us from what we consume. And we also have microbial components that can get from there as well. So you've got all the microbes and the food, it's all mixed together in the bowel and it's all being fermented. The microbes break down the food just like a compost heap. So our bowel is like a compost heap. And uh, often, you know, you'll see you know, all things mixed together that are plants that do really well in a compost heap. Grapes and broken down some old cabbage that you didn't need and some spinach. And, but but that, that operates quite well and it's reasonably tolerable to the nose if you walk past that. But if you throw in some old half-eaten chops and some uh, sausages that weren't quite finished at dinner, the next morning, it's got a foul smell to it. And there might be some rodents that have come and started to eat at that. You might have some flies if it's hot, maybe some maggots. Some disgusting things start happening there in that environment. And um, in a similar way, if we only put plants in, we've got a fairly innocent sort of fermentation activity with less pathogens. And this, again, this is supported by science. Meat does introduce pathogenic strains of bacteria, which aren't going to be supportive especially if we're already immunocompromised, meaning, and let's go back to the leaky gut intestinal permeability. So what happens is that, and this has been measured now so clearly that this is no longer speculation like it was when I was first diagnosed and I went to a naturopath and she said, you've got leaky gut, right? And, and she was like off with the fairies and, and, and but she was right. She was right. And these days now, it's, it's really solid science. And so with rheumatoid arthritis patients, they've shown that the degree of excessive permeability, the, the bacteria and food particles that are moved to the bloodstream, that is over and above the way that it should naturally occur, the degree of movement is directly proportional to the amount of symptoms that a person has. So that if we can, as they say in the science, arrest the, the intestinal permeability, we can arrest the disease. And this is profound uh, position to be in now with the science to show that it's that strong, the relationship and that the, the aim, at least from those researchers who study the microbiome and disease link, should be to work on getting that gut right. And, um, and I'll come back to that uh, about healing the gut, but let's continue to talk about what happens when it's in a state of, of, of excessive permeability. So uh, studies have shown that the, um, the membrane of those bacteria when broken down are very immunoreactive and uh, the body then develops a, uh, an antibody. Uh, sorry, an autoimmune response to these particles that shouldn't be in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. just as it would when some other uh, uh, stimulatory particle or pathogen enters the bloodstream, the, the body will react and create an immune response. What's been found is that these particles can end up in the actual joints of rheumatoid arthritis patients. And so the action of inflammatory uh, or the process of inflammation is occurring at a joint level as a reactionary mode to 
actual whole bacteria and bacterial components that are in the joints of RA patients. Mm. And so this is, this is part of it. And it is complicated. And I don't claim to understand it fully, even though I've been studying it for 10 years. And, and it's because I, I think, to be fair, there's still uncertainty amongst the research community who are the leading edge. But there's also this concept of um, cross-reactivity, where some of the particles also appear, when I say particles, I'm talking about protein-related uh, macro particles, also look similar to the joints, the cartilage, the synovial tissue. Uh, sorry, so, are these micro protein particles, are these the things that came out of the gut that shouldn't be there? Okay. Correct. Okay, got yes, it. Yes, they, so they, uh, they are. And they can be what they call commensal as well. They can be actually healthy bacteria that's going in there, but it's just not meant to be in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be in the gut and that's where uh, it's harmless. And so that's right, these, these, in, these sort of uh, 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 incorrectly located particles and bacteria are ending up in joints and that's where an inflammatory reaction is occurring. And as I was just about to say as well, uh, there's also then this cross reactivity or molecular mimicry, a phrase that's not used as much in the last few years, but um, it gives you an idea as well of this mistaken, um, mistaken behavior of the immune system and saying, hey, there's some collagen that looks exactly like these things that are coming in to my bloodstream that I have now been attacking for the past six months. Oh my, and there's some in the knee, there's some in the elbow, there's some in the fingers. I have a lot of work to do. And the immune system's highly engaged, breaking down the body and you become tired. And so one of the symptoms of RA is that you become tired and uh, it's because one, one of the reasons is because your body is, is busy. It's at an immune level, uh, you know, doing a lot of work and most of it very unfortunate for the host. Okay, so as Dati and you have, have, have decided that inflammation, fighting inflammation is really important and you stated that healing the gut is the key to that. So what do you tell people who come to you with symptoms of RA, how do you get them started on their healing journey so they can be as healthy as you, by the way, who no longer have symptoms, even though at one time you could hardly walk? Yes. So what do we do? Firstly, let's talk about that. And let's talk about um, uh, my sort of second part of my journey since the TED talk, if you like. Um, but in terms of what to do, so this is obviously a very long answer and it depends on someone's current situation. So if someone currently presented like your mother-in-law and she was taking prednisone and she is looking to improve her health with inflammatory arthritis, um, I would talk about a plant-based diet and I'd go into specifics around that. But I would also point out to your mother-in-law that taking prednisone is a very strong pro intestinal permeability drug, meaning that uh, even in injectable form or in tablet form, it increases gut permeability. And so it would be a case by case, depending on the person's circumstances. But as I said, with your mother-in-law, I'd say, hey, we, we've got a challenge here. We uh, need to try with your rheumatologist's approval to look at your medication management, because if you want to try and reduce the underlying cause, you might need to shift the emphasis away from prednisone dependency, mm -hmm. right? And then I would look at her physical ability. I would look at her diet, obviously, the level of support that she has with her family, whether she has a Melissa or the equivalent, um, and, and just put together a plan. But if someone is doing this on their own and following our program, we do have these sort of uh, consideration points laid out for people and some milestones for people to hit. But especially with prednisone, um, that store at steroid is, is particularly challenging because it's like trying to heal the gut, but you've got one hand tied behind your back. And so some strategies are needed there to try and work um, around that and to be able to alleviate that sort of uh, 
uh, counterproductive nature. And not only terms- prednisone, right? People who take anti-inflammatories like yeah. uh, NSAIDs, right? Correct. Um, so ironically, <laughs> ironically, yeah. the things that reduce inflammation are actually um, increasing permeability of the gut and therefore increasing inflammation. Is that what I'm hearing? That is absolutely true. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and prednisone or and prednisolone, just a variation, they both increase intestinal permeability. And if I step away from the science and just my opinion, uh, the prednisone does more detrimental uh, impact than what the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs do. I've had people do our program who've been taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for 17 consecutive years and then be able to come off them in three weeks. So that's so what is it about your program that, t- tell us the natural ways, the things that you recommend that would help um, somebody heal, whether with medication or without it. So there's two rules that we must adhere to before we answer that question. The first rule is we want to have low symptoms at all times. This is paramount because inflammation in the joints corresponds to inflammation at the gut wall. And an inflamed gut wall is the greatest gut permeability mechanism of all. Mm. Inflammation at the gut wall is highly permeable. So we need to lower our inflammation levels so that we aren't leaving the gate open for the sheep to run out all the time. That's what's happening if we're inflamed. It's just leaving the gate open. So we've got to lower inflammation, whether it be through a non-counterproductive medication. I'll talk about that next. And then uh, through a, a good diet and exercise. Everything else matters as well, but diet, exercise and drugs These are your big three, and each of them have a massive impact on inflammation. So the rule number one, we must have low inflammation or the gate is left open. Uh, Number two, we can't be worsening month to month to month. If we observe that our joints are deteriorating month to month, then clearly our intervention is insufficient, probably pharmaceutically, um, but we can also try and address that with diet and exercise but we definitely want to be staying close to our rheumatologist at those times. If we're worsening month to month, we don't want to witness deterioration that's happening too quick. Right? So there are two rules. So to, to, so for the management of this, what do we do? Well, we've got drugs, diet and exercise are our big three disease modifying drugs like methotrexate, as it turns out, can reduce intestinal permeability. And so the drug that, is most common, most frequently prescribed to people with RA, uh, happens to have an impact on the underlying cause that nine out of 10 rheumatologists aren't even paying attention to that actually helps Mm. what I believe Mm. play the most benefit for the patient. And so drug therapy, when done correctly, uh, I don't only support, but I encourage because it can address the underlying cause and and tick the box for rule number one, which is we must have low inflammation levels. And so, um, you know, we mentioned prednisone, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, antacids, which are proton pump inhibitors, they create dysbiosis. So we want to be careful with those. Um, Fortunately, they're not too hard to come off when you shift to a plant-based diet. And the other is, of course, antibiotics, which I spent a lot of time talking about before. And so we only really ideally want to use those in cases that uh, uh, where it calls for an important intervention. Uh, there's a big discussion amongst the rheumatoid community about the Brown protocol and low dose monocycling and stuff, but we won't get into that for today. Okay. And then, so um, the second part, so we've got then the uh, diet and exercise. And I, I know that maybe, um, you know, you guys are expecting me by this point to have spent hours talking about spinach. Um, we haven't got there because there's so much other stuff that's involved, right? But yes, spinach matters. We should eat lots and lots and lots of leafy greens. Uh, they're our ideal food source for our gut bacteria. Um, you mentioned Dr. Brooke Goldner uh, in the introduction. Yes, I am friends with Brooke and she's big on green smoothies and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have the 
uh, sort of optional recommendation for green smoothies. But what we emphasize um, uh, with, with great uh, enthusiasm is big green leafy salads. And so we want to be eating lots of greens for a number of reasons, but mostly because they feed our healthy gut bacteria. They're also really rich in omega-3 compared to omega-6. And so we're also then uh, restoring some balance for an otherwise unbalanced uh, essential fatty acid ratio. You need a lot of leafy greens to get your omega-3s up high enough, but uh, it, it's definitely really helpful. We want to eliminate all high fat foods at the start. This is something that was more clear to me anecdotally and personally before it became clear from a science point of view. But if you bring me 100 people with rheumatoid arthritis and we halve their fat intake, tomorrow you will witness 100 people show uh, improvements to their mm -hmm. symptoms. So there's a concept of oxidative stress that became apparent to me only in the past sort of four or five years. Um, and the higher the fat intake, the higher the oxidative stress load via advanced glycation end products. And these are uh, significant uh, contributed to uh, inflammation with people with inflammatory arthritis because people with RA are very, very um, uh, highly exposed to free radical um, damage. And the reason is mm. because, because when your immune system is engaged, it uses free radicals as an attack mechanism against the perceived pathogen. Mm. So when an autoimmune disease is in rage, it is actually creating a lot of oxidative stress. So in studies of people with RA, they're low in vitamin C, they typically low in vitamin A, vitamin E, um, they've got very low levels of glutathione and uh, uh, um, what's the other one? Uh, catalase, superoxide dismutase. So they're low in these antioxidant enzymes, which are inside the cell itself, not just the ones we eat, but the ones that matter the most. So are you, they low because that's what made them vulnerable to RA in the beginning or because RA, you know, drives them low. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. RA drives them down. Mm -hmm. And so the body is constantly trying to offset this free radical load that it happens to be creating itself. And then it gets lower in the cellular antioxidant enzymes, but also in the, um, uh, the antioxidants that we can consume from our diet, like the C's and the A's and E's and so forth. So we just get depleted from all of these antioxidants. So what do we do? So we, we, we naturally and intuitively need to eat lots of antioxidant foods. And this can play a part of the role in trying to reverse that oxidative stress. Um, and the thing to know though, is that when we consume antioxidant rich foods, those antioxidant rich foods tend to only be helpful for the meal in which they accompany. So if we're going to eat lots of, uh, you know, like if say if we eat, you know, mung bean sprouts, which are really high in uh, antioxidants and enzymes and so forth, it's great, but it's not going, that's not going to necessarily help to boost our resources as much as what would be the third key factor, which is exercise. And the exercise. Can I just stop for one second, yeah. though? It, you talked about uh, what? What about dairy and meat? Because I know you say plant strong, but do dairy and meat actually hurt you, or should you just bump up the plants? So both. They do hurt you, and you should bump up the plants. And you'll sometimes see, uh, and it's it's happening far less than what we put out, which is success stories for people who are fully plant-based. But you do see from time to time, the paleo or keto community put out success stories about someone who has had results that are somewhat similar to what can be achieved on a plant-based diet from time to time. And 
what those people have done is typically eliminate food sensitivities and mostly it's it's usually dairy and seed oils and and i you know we can talk about uh, the oils uh, shortly which are a crucial factor but some people are just sensitive to dairy and some people there's a study that i recall that uh, when dairy was just removed from the diet of people with ra that there was a significant improvement in symptoms after a few weeks just from dairy being removed. So we know that's like a no-brainer. So any decent dietary recommendations should begin with eliminate dairy. So it's kind of like, oh, come on. It's like, yeah, get rid of smoking and, and get rid of dairy. It's like that obvious to me, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, but as for the meat, some people are able to continue to eat meat and remain with low levels of inflammation despite the meat intake. And the confusion arises sometimes where they think, oh, it's because I'm eating meat and vegetables and leafy greens. Therefore, I'm on the ideal diet, some kind of thing that we might have eaten back in the day. Um, but the truth is that the meat provides no, no clinically proven health benefit for an autoimmune patient whatsoever. Mm -hmm. other than someone might argue well you're getting you know high iron intake or whatever right but the truth is that there's there's the, the most studies show that the meat has counterproductive effects to the microbiome oxidative stress like i've talked about gut permeability direct increase in gut permeability and there's a one study that says meat attacks the joint rheumatoid arthritis review and inside that it's all about how meat seems to exacerbate inflammatory arthritis. So it, it's not even an, it's not even like a really a debate. And I, you know, haven't really spent much time going into it because for me, a lot of these things are given now. I normally have a pile of studies sitting on my desk and it's like, here it is. What am I about to hold up here? I better check this. <laughs> so <laughs> let me hold up. A, 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 uh, anyway, the, 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 Mostly I have stacks of studies on my desk and I could hold up any one of them. And it's just, here's a review, 2017, 2019, 2020, right? The, you know, and it's like recommendations by the authors who've done review studies, plant-based diet, elimination process to eliminate food sensitivities. And so, you know, it's like, let's, let's not debate, just go to the science. Like, I, I don't need to prove here. Just go and read this paper, read that paper, read that paper, right? So it's gotten to that point now. And, um, and yeah, so meat, dairy, and, and oils. This is, where, this is where people get a little bit, um, it is where it's not as popular to a lot of folks, but if you have an autoimmune inflammatory arthritis condition, you'll do better with no oils at all, okay? Now, I don't care if someone is plant-based and they have some olive oil on their salad. It turns out that the evidence is pretty balanced on that and it might have no problems whatsoever. And I'm not the expert on that, but we'll talk about rheumatoid and I'll tell you, stay off the olive oil and especially don't eat oils that have been heated because heating oils really jacks up the oxidative stress potential the free radical load and a restaurant oil is the worst of all because it's not olive oil it's like sunflower oil or something like this then they heat it over and over and over again to cook their chips and put the veggie burgers in or to fry on the thing it's oil that has been reheated there was a study, I think it was done in India, but you know, that's probably irrelevant, but the study was all about reheating these vegetable oils. And they measured the free radical capacity of, a oil, of an oil after every reheat. And it went up and up and up and up. And so, uh, you know, that can, that can undo the, the best of us if we go and add to a restaurant and eat a big bowl of sweet potato fries or a big veggie burger that's dripping in oil. If you've got an autoimmune disease and you're doing that, you're rolling the dice because none of us are immune forever for having symptoms return if we behave in that way. And interesting, whilst, you know, whilst it might be satisfying to say it's the meat, it's the dairy. Well, yes, it is those, but heated seed oils are worse than those. 
No, I'm just, I'm being, feeling so sad. I, I, I'm trying to be really good. And I just have, I have, I love French fries and I just do it once or twice a month, but that is definitely what's happening to restaurant French fries is like that oil. Is yeah. like, oh. yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm just going to, I know you have my... an air fryer though. You could do it yourself. I just so say I do. Oh, I do. I, I eat air fried potatoes all the time, oh, but French fries, like fried in deep oil is Don't really see. down to like once a month. Like I just have a, but this is disgusting in, information and I'm going to stop. I'm just going to stick with the air fryer. Like yeah. you just Let sold me. me. Some, but this is, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating sort of uh, discussion point because two things I want to say, yes, your air fryer is like the greatest thing ever and stick to that. Right. But even I, even I being, you know, immunocompromised and as, as and, and delicate with, you know, inflammation sensitivity, I used to be able to eat French fries when I would eat them with salad. And I know no one wants to do that. Oh, Dusty. Dusty does. She, she's oh, extraordinary. Just, oh, yeah. I love salad and I love French fries. So, so French fries are probably her only, if right. you could call it a vice, it's your only vice. Otherwise, she's perfect. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes, yes. Let's go with that. <laughs> no, your diet's really, really good. So, <laughs> so, that, so just have a big salad. Yeah. Have your kale, yeah. your massage kale salad, Dotsy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. And go you with can, the. You, you can get away with it. You can get away because it's the combination that that yeah. enters the stomach that matters. You see, so you've got all of these free radicals in the in the oil from the restaurant, but you've got all of these antioxidants from the leafy greens and they are there and they mm -hmm. coexist right physically at the same spot. And they, they have proven this time and time again, they, they counteract each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, it, it, at one point in the, at the end of your Ted talk, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the dairy and, and, and microbiota. Uh, but you talked about, um, one of the top GI docs on the planet, who's now no longer with us, but um, Hiromi Shenya, based out of the Einstein Clinic in New York at the time. And, and you said something that is astounding, that he said he has never seen a healthy intestine for someone who consumes dairy products on a regular basis. And he's seen over 350,000 patients in his practice over the many, many years. So never. And th th I mean, that obviously lends itself to really saying what, explaining what dairy does to the microbiota and the creation of leaky gut. And I will say too, that Dr. Angie Sadegi, who's a GI doc we've had on this podcast twice, she has told me that it's almost boring to some degree in her practice because about 70 ish percent, we had this conversation six months ago, it may have changed, but around 70 ish percent of people come in gut issues. She goes, get rid of the dairy and come back in two weeks. They come back in two weeks. If they've done it, they're fine. So it's like, she's not even really getting to even, you know, really practice, you know, try, tr you know, really trying to help them in all sorts of different categories and ways and, and prescription of, 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 of diet. It's just get rid of the dairy and come back and see me. And there, and then it's, you know, just, we should go into the practice of gastroenterology then, Dotsy, you and me, and we can, we can make a <laughs> killing just on that. Well, that's the problem. I don't think she, I, she doesn't because that she'd make a killing if she said, oh, we got to do this and this, and you got to go on this medicine, and everything. She, it's like, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's a hundred dollars and it's get rid of dairy and they're, and they're cured. So she's, <laughs> I think that that's a, that's a bummer part of it, I guess. And why not very many GI docs say that maybe. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. Uh, look, your quote was verbatim, and that's what uh, Dr. Shinya has written. I think it was in the Enzyme Factor, which is uh, one of his very popular books. Um, obviously, uh, from his name, he's a Japanese, a Japanese surgeon, and um, he very, was very popular in Japan. And actually, I didn't even know that uh, you said he passed. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, so... I'll have to look into that and, and send nice thoughts his way. But he, yes, said that uh, in a book. And so, um, and it was through his dietary recommendations that the Patterson program was born. So mm. at that time, I was eating a completely 
raw food diet. So this was soaked seeds, soaked nuts, and heaps and heaps of fruits and leafy greens. And um, that was it, right? Uh, so I would wrap my fruits and nuts and salads and sprouts in nori sheets, you know, the Japanese sushi sheets, mm -hmm. and eat them like burritos. And that was my that was my main food. Very bizarre. I tell you, and what, that's because you, to... you were taking out all the inflammatory foods that you fit you were um, reacting to. Yeah, yeah, and I and coming off that discovery with the cherries and the food poisoning, I had been reading a lot about enzymes, including the enzyme factor from Dr. Shinya, amongst many others. I had books and books that I was reading just about enzymes, and so I wanted to get as much natural food into my body as possible and and it was after eight months of that that my symptoms had come down but had uh, not not been reversed completely it took years for me to see uh complete inflammation reversal years um and but after eight months i read the enzyme factor and i i said to melissa i want to try eating the way that he eats and that involved daily repetition of just a mix of brown rice, amaranth, uh, uh, quinoa, and buckwheat. And he would mix it all together. So there's, you've got brown rice and then three pseudo grains. And he would mix it all together and he'd eat that three times a day, he said mostly. And I thought, okay, well, if he's eating that because he pays closest attention to what a colon looks like, and he's aiming for the ultimate colon. <laughs> I want the ultimate cold. And so, yeah, so I, I started doing a shinya and, uh, and eating like him, but without the brown rice, because I just felt like it, I don't know, I just had some suspicions around that. And I can't recall the reasons why. Um, I think it was the cooking time. You know what? That's what it was. It just wouldn't, because it takes 40 minutes. It took 40 minutes to cook in the rice cooker. Whereas those other little th three pseudo grains, they take like 18 to 20 minutes. And so I was just doing those. And that is the baseline foods on our program. When people start our program, they start with a mix of those buckwheat, quinoa, and, uh, and amaranth. And we just see, you know, a really rapid reduction in symptoms. Those grains are incredibly nutrient rich, complete proteins and the whole works. And so we eat that lots of, lots of leafy greens and some sweet potatoes and that, rapidly reduces inflammation and then we test foods back into the diet one at a time to avoid food sensitivities which is another major component of ra dietary challenges is that everyone with ra responds to different food sensitivities um, and uh, they can exist in the plant-based spectrum as well so we cut all the foods back to simple ones that are super anti-inflammatory and then just add plants back one at a time in a recommended sequence and people become a little bit their own detective and so oh, that one worked that one didn't work and after a couple of weeks they've got enough diversity to feel happy and the pain's low and they can start getting into the exercise and yeah and life's looking much better and let's get into the exercise because i cut you off when you started to go in there to to get oh. deeper into food and i'm glad that we we did thank you but let's go to exercise because you were saying that was also a very important component. Yeah, I think that if in the in the big three, the diet, exercise, and drugs, uh, people are really, really normally good with their with their diet and drugs. Um, everyone's you know going to their rheumatologist uh, appropriately, and and they'll learn from our podcast and so on, and they will go and they'll say, hey, I'm not sure about these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like. Well, uh, well, what can we do? And, and so that's good. And people can become incredible with the diet and make every single nuance. And they're adding an extra green juice in their morning and documenting on their, on their, um, their pain charts and they're doing everything wonderfully well. And then they'll say, they'll, they'll, they'll email me in our support group and they'll say, hey, you know, I'm doing, all, I'm doing everything perfectly, but I've still got some pain in my elbow and this. And I'll say, okay, so which of the exercises are you doing on your elbow? Uh, uh, you know, there's no, there's no it's, it's missing. Exercise is crucial. It's a form of medicine with rheumatoid arthritis. It really is. So I say that we have exercise deficiency. It's a, it's a, it's a condition 
right? And so we need to address that exercise deficiency with medicine, of course, movement. And it does two things. One, it restores the integrity of the connective tissue to the joints. The connective tissue, meaning the tendons, can become inflamed and weak through inactivity because the joint hurts, so you don't move it, so it becomes weak, or it gets caught up itself in the actual inflammation process that's circulating in that joint. The way out of, inf of tendonitis is, is engaged soft tissue. It's using the joint. And so you've got to find a, a way of finding that sort of delicate balance between using the joint so that you can reduce the soft tissue inflammation without stirring up the capsulated synovitis, which is coming from the autoimmune immune process. But if you find it, then you will see tremendous results through just repetitious movements, um, you know, simple exercises with bands and so on. So it's totally doable and encouraged by the literature. Medical literature says people with RA should be encouraged to exercise safely. But the other part of it, and this is, this is as, as exciting as anything else we've talked about, exercise is the number one most effective way to increase our antioxidant enzymes of glutathione and superoxide dismutase and catalase and the, the actual massive built-in fire extinguishers that we have, that we, that we need to use against oxidative stress. And, and there's no other thing that you cannot consume glutathione yes. supplements to any kind of effect that exercise will have. And it doesn't need to be excessive. Uh, one study showed that um, uh, a group of um, soldiers engaged in, uh, I think it was weekly, bi-weekly at the most, but let's say, let's say bi-weekly at best, twice a week, yoga followed by deep breathing and med short meditation session, session, twice a week, increased their glutathione by 50% over six months. That, that's phenomenal. That, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, is the greatest natural drug you could ever be given. And so uh, I just, I really want to encourage anyone who's on the fence with, with this, that even if you don't have inflammatory arthritis, in fact, you probably don't, you know, it's, a, it's as we said, one or 2% of, 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 the, of, of the Western population. Um, become fit and strong. It is the funnest, most awesome thing that you can do for your life. When you notice that you're becoming fitter, you just get out of bed with this internal smile and you know that like you're awesome. And when you become stronger, it, strength defeats inflammation. They've measured this in, in simulated human tissue that an engaged mm -hmm. muscle, an engaged muscle, muscle gets rid of the inflammatory markers in that, in that muscle engage the muscle, use the body in a way that it's meant to be used and challenge it to the point where you're within your safety zone and push that a little bit more all the time because strength defeats inflammation and feeling fit and strong. It's the antidote for stress. It's the antidote for everything. It's, it's, it's the best. So get, yeah, get in the, the weightlifting, not just the cardiovascular. What I'm thinking of, of people that are in ex, extraordinary amounts of pain and they see the Humira commercial. And I have no idea if Humira is, is not steroidal, right? It's okay. So it's not methotrexate and it's not steroidal. It's a different uh, vehicle or system, but that certainly sounds like it's more immediate than starting an exercise program. When you're in a, a pretty extensive joint pain can, 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 I would assume be excruciating. So what do you tell people first day they're like okay i'm not going to take the drug route i'm going to stick with this but it's going to take a little bit more time probably i mean what it what are they jumping jack like what are they supposed to do when they're in in joint pain exercising is not going to feel great on the day one or even day 10 probably my message is this maximum health minimum symptoms Okay. Now okay. there's no speak of drugs in there. You can have maximum health and take Humira and Remicade, any of these sort of medications. Mm -hmm. And remember the two rules of thumb, 
we've got to have the lowest possible inflammation and not be worsening. Humira is a great option for a lot of people and you can do a lot of gut healing and increase your exercise and live an extraordinarily wonderful life taking that drug or any of these biologic drugs. Okay. Like fantastic, good for you. But in, but in terms of what else can you do lifestyle wise, mm -hmm. let's, you know, what else can you do? So if you are incapacitated, I have a, a sort of a, a, a exercise pyramid um, if you cannot okay. physically move, you are absolutely incapable of moving, then you should start with an infrared sauna. Infrared sauna uh, can help to increase circulation. It can make you feel better. It can calm you. Uh, anecdotally, it seems to reduce some symptoms of people with rheumatoid arthritis. The studies are not like mind blowing, but I would start with an infrared sauna. You can pick one up for, I don't know, a thousand bucks or something that you can hop into and do it on the floor. It's like a, a zip up thing, right? To your chest. Mm -hmm. They get expensive if you get a cabin and so on, but do something, right? And then when you're in the sauna, start moving the head, right? Move the head mm -hmm. back, right? Let's get some movement going. If you can only move your head, move your head. If you can move your shoulder, move your shoulder. And then let's build head, shoulder and foot the next day. And you get the message, right? We've, everyone can, can start somewhere. And from a starting point, we can improve. And, and uh, yes, you, 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 you joked about the jumping jacks and stuff. Um, we're talking about uh, very, very sensible um, amounts of movement that is applicable to each, every individual with the aim to just see uh, if we go like just a little more, if we can do a little more each day and a rule of thumb, and this one should be in a box if it were in on like a blog post, um, all exercise with rheumatoid arthritis can cause a little discomfort and that is okay. Yeah. As long as the joint doesn't feel worse the next day. Okay. That's the rule. That's great guidance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so folks can check out your Patterson program if they're interested. You have an uh, RA reversal toolkit. You have lots of information on the site, which is pattersonprogram.com. And they can um, ask you questions there. Uh, um, I, see, I see you respond to letters sometimes um, to emails <laughs> and uh, they're very informative. So thank you. Yeah, that's a great place to start. We have a lot of um, you know, the podcast history there. Uh, the podcast changed names because I'm, my book is going to be called Rheumatoid Arthritis Solutions. And so the podcast is now called Rheumatoid Solutions. It's on okay. iTunes and all places that people can find great podcasts. Awesome. Like yours. Great. And Thank you so much for being on the show and helping so many people with all this fantastic, really specific information and your inspirational yeah. story. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I didn't realize how prevalent it was, and you, you're saying that the, the numbers of, of one to 2% was, I, was shocking. I thought it was higher because our um, one of our cuts from Dr. Goldner's episode is like 350,000 views, which means people are searching rheumatoid arthritis and, and you know, and green shakes and, 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 and Brooke. But uh, I thought, oh my gosh, we got we to gotta do more on this because it's, it's, it, it, it's people who have it are probably people who love people who are suffering. And also it covers auto, all sorts of autoimmune diseases. So this show will help people who have yeah. not only RA because you help people who have all sorts of autoimmune diseases. Okay. Yes. Inflammatory arthritis, just as a blanket term, like yeah. we talked about, you know, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis and lupus and so on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Hey folks, okay, back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long, does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. 
We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.